everyone and welcome back to another segment of Cisco Networking's Ask the Expert video series. Today's session will be focused on Wi-Fi 6E and here to give me all of the details is technical marketing engineer Jim Florwick. Thanks Jim for being here and now let's get into what the people want to hear. So a lot of people have been talking about the evolution of Wi-Fi and its capabilities. Can you give us some background information on Wi-Fi 6E and what makes it so different from previous generations? So Wi-Fi kind of began humbly back in 1999 as just a, a curious experiment. And Wi-Fi 1 was neat. It was out there. It was for convenience. Um, but there wasn't really any economic benefit to it uh, other than it was cool. Uh, and over time, through all of the, the improvements that we brought to the technology, um, it's grown tremendously as far as who's depending on it, how we're, how we're making it uh, part of our economy. Uh, all the way up to Wi-Fi 6, which really took a different approach. Uh, all the way through Wi-Fi 5, we were on essentially the same protocol with improvements. Uh, Wi-Fi 6, they started over from scratch uh, and kind of said, you know, what's wrong with Wi-Fi? Let's fix it. Um, so Wi-Fi 6 brought us a very high efficiency protocol um, that overcame a lot of the limitations that we know in current Wi-Fi. The other part of that equation was the spectrum. Um, so over the time from 1999 or 20 years or so, um, we just added little bits of spectrum as Wi-Fi became more crowded. And what we wound up with was really a disjointed spectrum that limited its efficiency and the capacity. So Wi-Fi 6E is the largest spectrum grant we've ever received. Uh, and it goes further, it limits what can operate there and it really brings Wi-Fi into the modern age as a, as a viable wireless technology uh, for every industry. So Wi-Fi 6E sounds like it's going to be a huge game changer for many industries, but that kind of brings a question to mind. What does the rollout of Wi-Fi 6E look like? Is it uniform globally or are there some differences that customers should keep in mind? Wi-Fi 6E, um, first out, a lot has been put into this to simplify it, uh, and it's happened really, really fast. So uh, the, the changes were almost daily through 2020 uh, and then 2021 uh, with who's adopting it and how they're adopting it. But around the world, there's really two models. Um, FCC, which is where it was ratified first, uh, adopted 1200 megahertz of spectrum, which is about twice as much as we enjoy in Wi-Fi uh, presently. So it was a, it was a huge deal. Uh, and then there's an Etsy model, which is Europe, uh, that brings in 500 megahertz as, as a alternative proposal. And that really, that gives countries that want to adopt that more time to free up the spectrum uh, and consider expanding later. So that being the case, everything else around Wi-Fi 6E, some of the minor regulations, uh, power limitations, uh, have all been pretty consistently uh, employed. Even though the wording changes from region to region, um, you're getting about the same technology everywhere. So it does simplify the rollout. Um, a lot of countries, as they adopt this, uh, may change up. Australia, for one, uh, adopted 500 megahertz. Uh, as their first pass and that's what's been ratified but then they went right to work on getting the other 700 megahertz and expanding the 1200 megahertz. So I think it's it's going to be uniform uh, around the world, much more uniform uh, that is uh, than current Wi-Fi spectrum has been implemented. So that was actually a goal of Wi-Fi 6E. If you'd like to learn more about your country's readiness of Wi-Fi 6E, please make sure to visit wifi.org. So Jim, here's another important question. With more devices connecting to the network, I'm sure our listeners are concerned about security. Can you share with us how the security parameters will change when it comes to Wi-Fi 6E? Wi-Fi 6E, um, like so many other things it did, really kind of sought to break uh, from that legacy model that we've been in. One of the great attractions of Wi-Fi has always been that you got that backwards compatibility, but the backwards compatibility came with costs like performance, security, uh, because the newer spectrum or the newer protocols actually had more capabilities. So we've been in this game, you know, as we grew, uh, Wi-Fi 6E breaks that uh, in that it takes all of the great security advancements that we unveiled with Wi-Fi 6, 
makes those mandatory in the Wi-Fi 6E spectrum, which we can do because all of the clients are at the same level. We're not, we're not reaching all the way back to, in some cases, Wi-Fi 1 clients still operating on the network. So with Wi-Fi 6E, WPA3, which is the latest encryption uh, requirements, is mandatory uh, as an entry point. So you cannot even operate in 6E without operating uh, WPA3. And Cisco's implementation of that enforces that as well. Um, so there won't be, in the past when we've had these security advances, there's always been that, that gray zone of we still have legacy clients operating and I need to operate those. So there's always been this mixed mode uh, mentality where yes, most clients are operating that way, but you have that weakness. That's over in 6E, so it's been very well thought out. Security is a huge concern for many individuals and customers, so I'm glad that Wi-Fi 6E is taking it up to another notch. Now, on the other hand, I'm sure our listeners are wondering about their legacy clients. Jim, is there, is there anything that you can share with our customers around what they have already deployed when it comes to Wi-Fi 6E? With Wi-Fi 6E, the fact that we're no longer required to operate with legacy clients with backward compatibility gives us that speed and that determinism that, that we've been looking for in Wi-Fi. Uh, because we're no longer essentially breaking it to accommodate lesser capabilities. Um, the downside of that is that you're going to need a new client uh, to operate in Wi-Fi 6E uh, because it's a different radio frequency or radio spectrum. Uh, the upside to that is we no longer have those legacy clients operating and if you can think of an analogy uh, like an F1 Formula One race, right, with a golf cart thrown in the middle of the racetrack uh, is essentially what happens in the existing spectrum today when we accommodate slower or less capable clients. Uh, Wi-Fi 6E promises to be a Formula One race with nothing but F1 cars on the track. So it sounds to me that Wi-Fi 6E is not fit for just one industry. It's fit for all. So can you share with us some use cases about Wi-Fi 6E that our customers can benefit from? Sure. Um, you know, what we've talked about so far is the reasons that Wi-Fi 6E is so important to Wi-Fi with the, the benefits in capacity, uh, lower latency, higher performance. And these benefits uh, are actually setting us up for the future uh, of Wi-Fi in the, in the environment. Uh, and industries such as education that's looking at VR and AR technologies, XR technologies uh, to enhance remote learning. Uh, healthcare for remote healthcare, uh, which has become telemedicine's become huge here recently, uh, is going to benefit from that. Retail, uh, automated logistics systems. Uh, we have warehousing now where they're very interested in having high speed, high performance coverage from the floor to the ceiling because they're literally sending workers up with VR headsets that show them what to pick off the shelf. So I don't think there's any industry, workspaces, manufacturing, public venues with higher capacity. Uh, manufacturers always have been a very latency sensitive environment. So it really takes the economic proposition that Wi-Fi represents uh, and expands that to another level. Uh, it, it puts us on a fair footing for the future of Wi-Fi. Thank you so much, Jim, for being here and sharing your insights of Wi-Fi 6E. Thank you, Jasmine, for having me. Absolutely. I think I've learned so much from our conversation. And if you'd like to learn more, please visit cisco.com slash go slash wireless.